what better day is there for us to meet straight after World Teachers Day? And on behalf of all the partners, we want to thank all of you who teach and who've made the time to join, often at antisocial hours, for your amazing work, particularly in these times of crisis. And what better time for us to tackle this topic than at this moment of converging global crises and the accelerating polarization of both our societies and our economies. You know as well or better than I do that COVID is a threat multiplier that is hitting those on the margins, the poorest, hardest, and that equity is absolutely fundamental to our pathways for recovery. I firmly believe that COVID also has to be an opportunity, that there are new market demands and values and needs being expressed in our societies. And I think that people on this call today are part of this moment of radical reinvention, which is going to require courage, patience and leadership. So Salzburg Global Seminar, for whom I have the honor to work, um, is also in its own way a bold act of recovery. We were founded uh, at the end of World War II and are rooted in courage in humanism and a very deep dedication to education as a tool of recovery. Our DNA is intergenerational. We were founded by three young people who met at Harvard in 1947. And they were inspired by the Marshall Plan for economies that were being forged by governments to think in their turn of a Marshall Plan for the mind. How could you restore learning opportunities and mutual trust for people who had been brutally divided by conflict and deprived of the opportunity to own and shape their own learning pathways? It's so relevant today. And nearly 75 years on, we are an actor in global change deeply committed to the sustainable development goals, to equity and inclusion. We have around 38,000 fellows in 175 countries since we were born. And we are committed to bring non-standard and rising voices who can really think about the critical sectors for society and what kinds of new leadership values and approaches are essential. Everything that we do tries to deliver on three strategic aims to bridge divides, expand collaboration, and transform systems. And social justice cuts right across everything we do. Just a couple of examples. The work we do around money, around how finance is flowing in today's world, looks, for example, at how philanthropy can become more inclusive and global. What strategies can philanthropy use to become, to address social, economic and historical inequality? In the work we do around health, um, we work very closely with, for example, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to look at the role of inclusive urban development and investment for building equitable and healthy communities. And we're now beginning work on youth justice and safety, working on a major program with the MacArthur Foundation and other partners to think in a holistic way at what drives exclusion, violence, uh, implicit bias and prejudice that impedes the life chances of too many people. So these are areas of great relevance when we think forward, not just on social justice, but on how social and emotional learning is a transformative lens and driver of change. At the very heart of the way we try to work is co-creation, a multi-year, multi-stakeholder engagement to really think systemically about change. And that brings me neatly to our work on education for tomorrow's world and of course the power of partnership. Today's program looks at the intersection of social and emotional learning and social justice through the lenses of pedagogy and assessment. Now, Really since 2016, we've focused on social and emotional learning. And we're very lucky that this focus has coincided with the evolution of a really courageous and like-minded alliance of partners who support and make possible Salzburg's global work in many ways. They include the Qatar Foundation International, Microsoft and ETS. And I'm so pleased to be all together virtually today. One of the most interesting examples of impact that our social and emotional learning work has uh, helped us incubate is Karanga, the Global Alliance for Social Emotional Learning and Life Skills. 
And today's event is part of a week of online activities for SEL that Karanga is supporting. You can find a lot more on the website and we can put details in the chat box. Um, but I would just like to highlight that Karanga and our partners commitment to leadership for SEL is something that makes me profoundly optimistic in these troubled times. So before I pass over, um, I wanted to highlight that today is shared. Yes, you have some distinguished panelists, but it's highly interactive. So firstly, because SEL matters to us so much, and we're going to keep up this on online programming right through the fall and into next year, please share your ideas, amazing, unusual, unexpected, whatever, in the chat box, because that helps us co-create for tomorrow. Um, please, in the chat box, feel free to say who you are, where you're from, what you do, um, and to ask questions of each other. If other people post questions and you have an idea or a link that you want to help with, put it in there. We'll save the chat and we're really about trying to build collective resources today. The session is being recorded. The recordings will go up on the Salzburg Global website in the next couple of days. So don't panic if you feel you couldn't capture everything. In closing, um, I mentioned ETS before, and ETS has been one of the longest standing institutional partners in Salzburg Global's history. And we have 10 years of proud partnership for education for tomorrow's world. Um, I thank Michael Nettles, who will be part of the assessment panel later today. I thank Catherine Millett, who I'm about to hand over to. And just the other day, Catherine posted a lovely message on social media that it was 10 years of partnership and that she couldn't wait to get back. The greatest thing about the work we will do together, and I think which underpins the whole vocation of education, is that deep sense of the deeply human, and that just how important the future of our world depends on the dedication and generosity that we give to each other and to learners of all ages. So with that, I thank you so much again, and I'm really proud to pass over to my friend, Catherine Millett. Thank you and have a great discussions today. Wonderful. Thank you, Claire. It's always wonderful to be with you at a Salzburg Global Seminar event, whether it's in Salzburg or now virtually. Um, well, hello. I'm Catherine Millett with ETS in Princeton, New Jersey in the United States. And on behalf of the partners, Qatar Foundation International, or QFI as we call them, Microsoft, Salzburg Global Seminar, and ETS, I am delighted to welcome you to our first virtual convening for Education for Tomorrow's World program at Salzburg Global Seminar. And as Claire said, this is our 10th anniversary with Salzburg, and we at ETS are just thrilled with the decade we've had and are excited about the decade that starts this week. It was a year ago on Saturday that my colleague Michael Nettles, who you'll hear from later, gave the opening remarks for what has become the Education for Tomorrow's World program. So some of you may be asking yourself, what binds these four organizations? A global tech company, an organization devoted to fostering a deeper understanding of the Arab world through the teaching of Arabic and its culture, an organization that convenes current and future leaders, and a global assessment company. Well, it's our respective missions and values. While our organizational approaches to working with people worldwide differ, each of our organizations values the role that education plays in helping today's and tomorrow's learners achieve their educational goals. Social and emotional learning, or SEL for shorthand, is a topic that united us for we each acknowledge that academic skills alone are not enough to be happy and successful in school, work, and life. Imagine what can happen if every learner on the planet achieves their educational goals. I just think it would be breathtaking to witness, and I hope I do in my lifetime. So these days, one of the things that I'm trying to do more of is to see the positive side of the global pandemic. One positive is that I am at this webinar with you today. Because truth be told, we probably would not have had this webinar were it not for the pandemic. You see, the partners were all planning to be in person in December with about 60 other people. But the upside is we now have the opportunity to meet colleagues from all over the world who otherwise might not have been able to travel to Salzburg to join us, 
due to personal commitments, the inability to actually leave the countries where they reside, or just sometimes personal emergencies. So welcome, and we are so glad, as Claire said, that you are with us today. So here are two words that I want to offer to you as the positive outcomes that I hope you will see from your participation today. And those words are community and collaboration. Community. My hope is that today will not be a one-time connection with Salzburg Global Seminar. Perhaps you are like me these days. I choose webinars based on the topic and where I might connect with people who share my interest. I admit, I tend to drop into a webinar and leave when I get the information I was looking for. My hope is that you will see that Salzburg Global Seminars are different. They are about building community. As we pivot from in-person meetings to virtual ones, we are navigating building community online. As Claire said, we have been developing opportunities to connect people who are not physically together, but who prioritize SEL. Karanga is a great example. People from a host of different countries are coming together around this topic. And not only do they come from different countries, they come from different perspectives on the work they do in social and emotional learning, their roles and how they have agency for working on social and emotional learning is different, but it is that shared common interest in social and emotional learning that brings us together. In the coming months, we will continue to reconfigure or reinvent what new ways of building community around SEL, social justice, and inclusive pedagogy. So I would like to reiterate Claire's invitation to please let us know if you have any ideas about how to build community in our new virtual world, about ways that you would like to be a part of it. But in, the, in essence, I just want to welcome you to our community of Salzburg Global Cellos global seminar um, because it's a community that is growing and is thriving. The second word that I want to um, leave with you today is collaboration. Because what we do on today's program and the knowledge we gain is very important. And we want to make it again, not be just a morning together and then we go our separate ways. We strive to move beyond talking in the work that we do at Salzburg Global Seminar. Examples of the fruits of our collaborations produced by Salzburg Global Fellows range from writing Salzburg statements that have been given to policymakers and institutional um, leadership, co-authoring books or book chapters, consulting on program design, reviewing data collection instruments, reviewing books, speaking at SEL events around the world to bring in different perspectives on, on this topic, and perhaps my own personal favorite, mentoring. And I view mentoring both as the people who mentor me and the people who I mentor. And I have to say one of the amazing things is that the people who mentor me range in age from about 25 to about 65, I think, or older. It's a wonderful community of people from all ages and places. And I'm just so glad that you are with us today. Finally, I just want to say again, thank you for joining us. I hope this will be the first of many times that we will be together. Dominic, I'm going to go then to our first panel, if that's okay with you. So I now have the pleasure, actually, of moderating um, our first panel today. And as he said, this is the first panel for the virtual SEL series on uh, 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 social justice. So let me introduce um, my colleagues, uh, Rala Kadaj, an educational specialist in the MENA region, Karen Edge from UCL Institute of Education, and Rob Ford from the Heritage International School. Uh, in this session and in part two of the program today, we are going to look at the intersection of social and emotional learning. And by social and emotional learning, we refer to developing skills for, for such things as developing skills for self-regulation, emotional regulation, empathy, compassion, and critical inquiry. And social justice is when we're looking at how to address the inequalities and inequities that are in our schools and in our communities through the lenses of SELs and inclusive pedagogies. 
In our pre-panel discussion, we were referring to the Georgetown University definition of inclusive pedagogy, for those of you for whom this may be a new term. And that is a student-centered approach to teaching that pays attention to the varied background, learning styles, and abilities of all the learners in front of you. It is a method of teaching in which instructors and students work together to create a supportive and open environment that fosters social justice and allows each individual to be fully present and feel equally valued. Our colleagues today will speak to the work they had been doing prior to March 2020 that focused on the role that SEL can play in helping students feel invited and included as well as how the pandemic, which we all know now has resulted in 1.2 billion children in 186 countries being dislodged from their classrooms, playgrounds, the schools that have had to shift their thinking and practice in places where they work. So I'd like to begin with Karen, if we may. And Karen, we're gonna ask you the first question. So the question we have today for you is, your focus is on tertiary education. You work with researchers and teachers in a master's leadership program in Qatar. Could you tell us about how your work to promote teachers adopting inclusive pedagogy in their classes prior to the pandemic and how you are restructuring your program with teachers now that all the traditional norms have gone? What are you learning about how we can work with teachers so they feel included and are acknowledged for the challenging times they are having in a pandemic classroom, be it virtual, in person, or hybrid? Karen, welcome. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to join you today. So I'm coming to you from London. And you're right. So one of the things that I'm doing this year is I've taken over the program leadership for our master's in leadership in Qatar. And it will be really interesting. So as opposed to faculty members flying into Doha and spending time face to face with our candidates, we've had to adopt a model that will be radically different. So one of the things that I teach is research methods. And usually as soon as you say you teach research methods, most of the people in the room look slightly <coughs> perhaps not at ETS, but many of the teachers and uh, researchers that I work with have not really dealt with research methods in an instructional environment since they were either in secondary school or undergrad. And I usually get a group of adults who are incredibly good at what they do in their day jobs, who arrive in my classroom and now in my virtual classroom, incredibly anxious about what they have to learn. There's something about research and data that can make lots of people quite nervous. It might be our dolls that still say that uh, math is difficult if you're a Barbie, but I think we've banned that one. But what I try and do and what I've always tried to do is, is do what you've just said in terms of building community and fostering collaboration. So there's a few ground rules, and I never really thought of them in terms of being cell ground rules. But when we start a class traditionally face to face, there's a set of things that I would say to people. So the first thing is, is that it doesn't matter to me if you're the Minister of Education or a first year teacher, that everyone is treated equally in class and that your opinions matter. The second thing that I would usually say is that your participation marks are not predicated solely on your participation. They're predicated on your participation, but also your ability to elicit the participation of others. Oh. And that changes a dynamic quite quickly. And the other thing that I will do is make it very, very clear that everyone has something to contribute to research methods. So, and everybody knows how to do research already. So we will spend a substantial amount of time at the start of any work that we do, mapping out what are the skills that a great researcher or leader would need. And then we fine tune what the five or six most essential ones will be for us to work together across our learning opportunity for the 10 to 12 weeks. And then everyone has to self-identify the one that they're the best at and use that to introduce themselves, but also proffer some assistance to others with their area of expertise. So what's been interesting for me is understanding a bit more now, there's been research that's come out that says in order for people to learn and feel safe, they need to feel that 85% of what they're doing is something they know already, and 15% is a stretch. So um, I can send around the article if that's helpful, but that's one of the things that I'm holding true as we transition from what is usually a very dynamic um, process to learn about research methods together, where we're face to face and I can get a really good read on who's not feeling comfortable and who's not. However, um, it's going to be different when we're dealing with it now. So in terms of my approach with teachers and leaders, in terms of how do you create inclusive pedagogy, from the beginning, I try and model what 
I think that should look like. So we will talk about everything. There is no question that can go unturned or unasked. And everyone has the responsibility for caring for everyone else to make sure that they're able to do their best work. What we're trying to do now is um, we, we try and approach research methods, at least I do, creating a set of bias spotters. So what we try and do, or I try and do in my classes is make sure that when people leave my class, they're much more aware of their own bias and their own assumptions, but they're also much more able to articulate when they spot other people using their own bias, either intentionally or unintentionally, and holding other people back from progress. So this time what we're doing is we're spending the invitations are going out today for me to spend 20 minutes with each of the individuals that I'll be working with to get to know them so they can get to know me a bit better and understand what my assumptions are. But we're also having to redesign our learning interactions in ways that create a safe environment where we try and adapt the protocols, but give people a chance to try and work through the issues of research methods. So it will be interesting. Most of the people we're working with are teachers and leaders working in schools, and they're under an incredible amount of stress at the moment. So we're trying to bring in the issues of Black Lives Matter, of well-being, and the science of the things that they're struggling with to use those as examples. But I think for me, it's really just helping people understand that bringing your whole self to class, we will never, um, the, the other fundamental rule that I think builds inclusion in, in my classroom environments is, as a grad student, I was uh, unmarried and didn't have children and I would constantly be told, oh, you can do the work because you don't have any responsibilities. So in addition to whether you're the minister or whether you're a first year teacher, we also have a discussion that whatever happens in your life in the background, we will accept that. However, if you are caught, assigning someone a piece of work or assigning someone based on your assumptions what their life is outside, there's punishments. Um, it, nice, helpful learning punishments, but you can never treat someone differently because of the life outside of class that may not be the same as yours. So that's the approach that we take and some of the struggles that, that we're challenged with, but I, I think we'll be okay. And I think that optimism and being able to reach out for colleagues, lots of them who are sort of sitting around the table today, both virtually in our webinar and at a distance is, is how we'll get through it. Great. Uh, well, now we're actually going to go to a real school. Rob, uh, here's a question for you. Uh, so Rob is um, in Moldova, um, and you are the director of one of the only international schools in Moldova. So you must have a really diverse group of students uh, with the children of diplomats, INGO, staff, and local children. Could you say something about how you and your staff use SEL and inclusive pedagogies to develop a school's culture that all students can see themselves in? Thanks, Catherine, and thank you to everybody. It's a real honour to be here and to try and share some of this story. Um, even before the lockdown, I think the challenge for any international school in the circumstances that we're in is how do you make sure that everybody feels part of that community, everybody feels valued, everybody's um, cultures, languages, um, backgrounds, all are equal in the school, all, all, all have that worth. And I think that was the challenge anyway for any international school. We have over 25 nationalities. We have a Russian-Romanian split within Moldova based on the historical legacy of this country anyway. So in many respects, I find as, a, as an English person, um, being a, in the rare position of being a unifier with the English language as we try to sort of find the common ground on how we communicate. Um, for us, we were always um, emphasizing the three C's, which you actually mentioned two of them, collaboration and community, but also that cohesion. So what is the glue that will keep us all together anyway. And obviously education is always the great leveler. Um, finding out together in class, being able to share the school's daily life, the stories, the assemblies, the, the common endeavors, the, 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 the things you put on, you know, like the plays, like the team games, like the school newspaper. That's always been the challenge um, for any school. For us, we've got a, a really interesting diverse community, as you say, from the embassies, from NGOs, from the UN, from WHO, UNICEF, um, from, from the local community as well. Um, for me, really, the challenges that have come from the lockdown are where we put our community and making sure that we don't lose anybody in this crisis, because I think the isolation we've talked, I mean, you know, we can change our language and, and we've made sure we're saying physical distancing, not social distancing. But again, we are scattered. I mean, I, I was in a class this morning and I've got kids in Australia, um, very much part of their class and taking part in their lessons daily, synchronously in the lesson with their 
peers and their friends here in Kishnev. And I think this approach, there's lots of different ways we've been able to bring that together. Um, I think um, the wonderful thing about the school is that my colleagues, um, I mean, every teacher right now around the world is going that extra mile, that extra kilometer, but my colleagues are really working hard to ensure that there's always something common to get um, people together, that no one is left behind um, in this, and that everybody's voice has value, but, but it, is a, it is a hard task. And I've drawn upon my own career a lot. I've been very fortunate to work in very strong school communities. I myself was a child in a mining community on the Welsh borders. So I knew the, the power of a strong community then and how everybody was included. Um, but in terms of the schools I've worked in, when I was in Wooten Bassett at the time of the, the repatriations from Iraq and Afghanistan at RAF Lynham, you saw a very sort of strange coming together of community at that point. And I've also, when I was in Wales, um, how um, the strong things, again, we don't always see them as the academic things. And, and, and lots of people have been talking about Maslow before Bloom, and uh, many people have been talking about recovery curriculums. And really what the children need are a lot of, a lot of certainty, a lot of routines, a lot of normality as much as you can make it. Um, my assemblies don't focus right now on COVID. They focus on, we're doing Black History Month right now. We did the UN Peace Day last week. Um, we've been doing climate change action. We are looking at all the issues and all the things that surround their lives. Why would Trump want to ban TikTok? All the things that they want to talk about. And in this way, we are giving them that normality and the sense that all their voices can come into that, um, that school narrative. And that's what I love about the school narrative because you know, a community of over 400 individuals, um, plus 100 staff, plus all their families, plus scattered around the world. There are so many different diverse voices. And um, I'll finish on this this morning. My, there's a family here from Armenia. We were talking about what's happening with Armenia and Azerbaijan right now. And when you think about what these people carry in their heads, what these young people carry in their heads to come to school and what we've got to give them to ensure there is a safe space here and there's a space for them to grow and to develop and be nurtured. Um, that really is still our timeless um, sort of, you know, clarion call as a profession to, to provide all of that. And at the same time as a school leader, I've got to make sure that all my colleagues are looked after and all their voices are being heard in all of this as well. Because ultimately, you know, that's how that sort of symbiotic relationship across an entire organization, especially in something like a school, um, is going to be able to kind of navigate through, you know, the, this huge challenge right now. And what we see is the incredible adaptability of people, um, not to lose hope, but to continue. And I think that's where it's humbling. And, you know, again, the more opportunities we provide. And children, just that, just that, that greeting on their face. And, and, and I think I said yesterday in our pre-panel discussion, you know, when they sang George Harrison's Here Comes the Sun at the end of the the academic year in May, you know, I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the, the house because we knew collectively we can get through this. We, we can get through this and we can find sort of hope and optimism. And I know that in uh, in the uh, the global seminar that, uh, that Salzburg did recently with Hattie, Hattie's talking about this golden ticket and this accelerator, you know, for what we can actually do. And I think actually we're going to come out of this stronger as communities. Um, the schools that have really invested in making sure you know, they're not leaving anyone behind and that they are still making sure, you know, smiling at people on the, on the Zoom or the Google Meet or whatever it is, making sure that there's a human being getting a human response from their teacher. I think that's the important thing not to lose sight of in all of this. Rob, thank you. That was great. And I'm going to pick up on um, two uh, word or phrases that I've heard this morning, um, sense of belonging and safe space. And we're going to turn to Rola now. So Rolo, you're a master trainer, a consultant with schools. And in our conversation yesterday, uh, you talked about it, that in your work, you consider the student and the teacher. Um, and one of the goals we know of inclusive pedagogy is to allow each individual to be fully present and feel equally valued. And you use the language and drew on your own past about that feeling that you belong. Yet we know for some students, they have experienced the evaporation of a school culture and they've seen the good glue of inclusion in schools disappear. So could you speak to 
bullying and maybe in particular cyberbullying and how it might be working against students feeling included and valued and feeling um, in some instances safe in their learning environment and how inclusive pedagogy might be used as a tool to mitigate bullying. So Rola, welcome. Uh, Rolla, we can't hear you yet. No, not yet. Uh, Can you hear me now? Perfect. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, thank you for having me today. I'm honored to be here. I, I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, in inclusion and bullying and SEL and social justice actually come together and we put the, it's like steps on the ladder going up to reach where we want to reach. And uh, first, if we're talking about inclusion, we're talking about feeling safe, being respected, being valued and all that you mentioned. And if uh, we talk about bullying, it has become even if it's not worse, it has become on a 24 hour basis. Before, when we used to talk about bullying in schools, it used to happen during school time. The child would go home, would feel safe, sit home and feel at least somewhere safe in his, in, in his home. Right now, cyberbullying is 24 over seven. It could happen anytime at any uh, hour of the day. And that could, be, uh, that could be very stressful to a child. So this is, this is something, this is a huge issue that everyone is talking about. Feeling, feeling inclusive would really need a lot more than just having certain practices in school. Trying to uh, mitigate bullying would definitely need inclusion is one of the things that we need to provide because um, it's, it's the setting probably, inclusion is the setting. We also have SEL where we can have to teach our students to give them the tools to actually uh, be able to be aware and manage their feelings towards what's happening to them, especially those who are bullied and try to, I don't know, overcome or try to deal with it positively if it can be done dealt with positively uh, probably dealt with in a sense understanding the, uh, the point of the other person but the biggest issue that we're really having right now is that bullying is not just a behavior it's it's a it's a it's a social issue it's it's based on uh the the uh, this this the, the abuse of power. It's something that is happening in our outside world, in our schools, in our homes, it's happening all over. So we really need to dig in and not just scratch the surface and sugar top things and just say, so I'm providing an inclusive uh, pedagogy in my classroom. Things are going to be happy and rosy. No, they're not. And I'm talking from my own experience. Like you said, I was one of those kids who were bullied and I had an excellent, amazing school, amazing staff, great education, but the bullying still continued. And the bullying was based on issues that we have in our societies, whether it is racism, whether it is sexism, whether it is culture, uh, different cultures, whatever. It is something that we really need to put on the table, open that closet, take that skeleton out and put it on the table and discuss it and let the kids know what's happening. So we are able to provide them with the tools when it comes to SEL, having dealing with their emotions and provide them with an inclusive environment in their schools or even when, when we're going online right now. Uh, we can we can still provide a sense of inclusion. We can still, but we need to put a bit more effort as as teachers, as head teachers. Uh, the glue for inclusion doesn't have to completely disappear, but it would need 
more of a humane effort on our behalf and to think that this is this is our mission it's not our it's not our job being teachers and and being head teachers is a true mission it's not a job so if i put that extra effort to support and help and work with those kids and let them know that i'm here whether it is i am online with them giving them a course or not this is going to make a huge difference having one having a child know that there's one adult who's willing to listen to him and that re research showed this, that having one adult listen, know that having a child know that an adult is there to listen to him mm. makes a huge difference, whether it is virtual or uh, whether it is in school. And I think probably, and that's my personal opinion, maybe virtually it'll be easier for them to communicate. They're not face to face. It could be through messages, through voice notes. So... We really need to bring it together, but we really need to as well address the main issues that we have and that we are facing and that we need to uh, bring out in the open. So like Rob said, uh, he said that um, they're, they're talking about Black Lives Matter. This is, this is something that's happening truly uh, uh, in, in our daily life. And it is, it, is, it is a differentiation between powers. Uh, I lived, I lived in, in the States and back then in the 70s, I was, uh, I was considered you know, the Arab terrorist. <laughs> I come to Beirut and I was considered the Americanized. So I never belonged anywhere. <laughs> oh. So, so it's, it's, it's really difficult for these kids to, to continue and not knowing that there's someone there to support and not knowing that it's a safe environment for them to be in. Great, thank you. Well, I wanna uh, thank uh, Karen, Rob, and Rolla for the opening uh, remarks. Very powerful in so many ways. Um, so I'd like to give you an opportunity to maybe ask each other a question or, or see the points of intersection um, because I see some points, but I'd, I'd love to have you uh, go ahead. So uh, would anyone like to start? Karen? Yeah, you look ready to go. <laughs> Always that lean forward, the inhalation. Well, I think it's it's um, it's really interesting. And, and when we had our initial chat yesterday, so I'm the mom of a 10 year old who has gone back to school and he loved lockdown. So he's at the point now where he's QR coding in everywhere on the hopes that someone will have COVID in a healthy way and that he will get to lockdown again. So but what what his joy about lockdown made me really realize was that I think there was a lot of what was going on at school, even though it's an amazing school that may not have been um, as joyous as I would have hoped as a mom. So my son is a quarter Canadian, a white Canadian, a quarter white British, a quarter Sri Lankan and a quarter Antiguan, and he calls himself beige. And what I try and do in my teaching is to try and help other people understand what it feels like to be an other which I didn't understand until I moved to England. And even as a white straight woman here, I talk funny and I, I don't belong. And I feel that every day. So Rala, listening to you talk about what your experience was as a kid in the, in the US, what I think we miss sometimes in these, in these bigger cell discussions is what parents need to support their kids. Definitely. So I, Isaac and I spend a lot of time now dealing with online bullies um, because that's the nature of their communication. But, you know, Rala, what would you say to parents? So there's teachers who are parents who might be equipped, but what is it that we as educators could do for families beyond the classroom to help them equip their, their children with the skills they need to be able to, to ride the bumps of bullying and to make a difference? Uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, um... It's community work. It's not only the educator who needs to do the work, especially now that we have uh, hybrid learning or virtual learning. So the parents are taking uh, a responsibility, which, which in some areas and in some countries were, uh, gave up on that responsibility. They would take the child to school and they would tell you it's your responsibility to teach him and bring him up. And whenever you, you have something to say, it's only by nature that the parents become defensive. Yeah. So we really need to we really need to open up with parents and discuss these issues as well, 
and, and set a plan together how we can make it more effective. So if, if I see, or if I am a parent and I am aware of some kind of bullying that's taking place among, the, among my kids' friends or my child or someone else, I would definitely uh, try to intervene. And this is something was not even happening in real life situations when we yeah. were meeting together and people would just ignore the fact that Rula is being, is, is being bullied. Because if they ignore it, things will get, will probably just go over and this is part of their child life, but it's not. And this is our first, it would probably be our first step to move forward. We're in this new world where we have to work together where we have to collaborate together. And I hope everyone realizes that, whether it is on a small community basis or on a larger uh, scale. So get the parents involved, have them, have them, uh, them feel what's happening. Let them know that people are, are getting hurt. And I'm sure, I am 100% sure that if we do get parents involved, I'm gonna have those parents who are gonna say, yes, I was a victim as well. Yeah. Thanks, that's helpful. Rob, please. Yeah, I, I, there's two points I want to pick up on. Um, I think, first of all, what Rolla said, I think this is so true of any good strategy towards inclusion in any school, which is having those people there, the advocates, the champions, informal and formal, mostly informal is better for every child. Um, that, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a terrible indictment when a child doesn't have somebody in the school they couldn't go to and, and speak to and confide in, you know, on, on sort of the administration or the adults. Um, and I think that comes back to how we're we building relationships in our school. How do we see the relationships in our school? Are they formal academic ones, as we perhaps see in, in a sort of the French system, um, the state system in France, where the teacher's role is to come into the classroom, teach the knowledge and, 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 and skedaddle. Um, or do we see it in the way that actually all good learning comes from strong relationships? It becomes from, from the trust, knowing your students, knowing one another. Um, and I think that's an interesting point, um, especially in these times where, again, going back to what's happened when we're in a hybrid system or we're on a distance learning plan or we're sort of sort, sort of return, but we're not, that all those daily interactions that we spoke about yesterday, where you could grab your, your lunch in the canteen and sit down with a group of kids. And, and I always make a point of sitting with some of the students who perhaps aren't the most vocal, that you know, are, are introverts, uh, have, have enjoyed this sort of method of learning because it's really played to their strengths. And actually some of our extroverts have found not being the sort of the center of attention or you know, uh, difficult for them to cope with when, when they haven't got the daily school life. But that, that's, that's been a real issue as well. Um, and I think the other point um, in, in this is as we go forward um, and we're sort of constructing a sort of new model of education in many respects, um, is how are we, you know, parents are seeing in our classrooms for the first time. That's really terrified a lot of colleagues because, not because they expect things to go dreadfully wrong, but if, if you teach a bunch of 15 year olds on a wet Wednesday afternoon, you kind of know what could go wrong. And, the dynamics of, uh, of those wet Wednesday afternoon classes in November. Um, and parents, sometimes I'm not quite sure they have some halcyon view of Mr. Chips and silent rows and things and schoolmasters in gowns, I, I don't know. But um, it has been real open about exactly how children learn and exactly what the dynamic of the classroom looks like and, and the formal learning and the informal learning. And actually uh, what goes on perhaps more outside of the formal classroom where kids learn. Um, and I, th I, th I think really that kaleidoscope has been shaken up. And um, as we are in, you know, at the centre of all of this is making sure children feel safe and supported and therefore they can learn and they can develop themselves and feel that they can progress and, and you know, all the challenges that we want to give them to, to become the young people that are going to hopefully lead society better than the present generation seems to be making um, a fist of it. So. Um, as, we, as we are going forward, um, and again, I come back to this word adaptability. What I've seen in the profession is so much adaptability. Um, I know a colleague here who leaves Vokaroo voicemails for kids if he hasn't picked up from them for a day. It's really simple, one minute, it's a human voice. 
and I know the response from children is, re is really good. And there are always such simple methods that we can. We had Teachers Day on Monday, which we couldn't traditionally do. And I love Eastern Europe for the way they celebrate education. And, and um, But they still did it. The choir still sang. They still had get, managed to get coffee and cake. I'm sure it wasn't poisoned with COVID, but they managed to do that in a good way. And again, all these things, people then come off their pedestals and they talk more or they interact and they ask about the weekend and they ask about sort of the music they're into or the you know their favorite team or what, what what's vexing them and we all know if we see a child in the corner that we go and spend some time with them and I think all of these things are sort of evolving and adapting so I am hopeful in the system but again it's not without its challenges right now and I'll, I'll come back to what I said I, I worry about those that perhaps are slipping through even more so than what in normal school um, and how are they coping and how are we able to find out they're not coping and how are we able to reach them and, and again those are the things that you know keep most educators up at night great so our, our online uh colleagues have chimed in and so i'm gonna uh pose a, the first question from the online community and uh we'll see who wants to respond first it, it kind of in a way uh, i think follows up with some of rob's uh, recent remarks so um online learning requires more time than tradition in-person learning and for students as well. It, um, it can be boring um, to sit with a computer. So how can we solve this problem to save students' well-being? Um, <laughs> it depends on the school. Um, I, I, the, the learning I've seen online has been phenomenal. I mean, this is what Hattie was referring to um, the other week. Um, it really depends how you viewed this. Um, it depends if you're trying to, to deliver very traditional lessons, you know, in the normal way on camera. And um, um, what I've seen is much more collaboration. I mean, as an international school, we've always had the world into our classroom. We've connected classrooms around the world. We've been using sort of platforms to do various projects, be it on climate change or on, on civic human rights. Um, and I think I think really it's just another craft of the, of, of the teacher. It's it's developing new pedagogy. I mean, you know, people thinking how their lessons. I watched a science lesson this morning with a with a group of children on, on online at home, and I saw children in the classroom, and they were all talking about food groups, and they were having to run to their kitchen cabinets to find uh, different boxes of food to tell them what a carbohydrate was and what a protein was. And the children in the class had a box of, and, and, it, and it, it was just a really lovely lesson very well crafted and everybody learning everybody engaged um i think we always think that sitting in front of a computer for seven hours is is distance learning and i think i think i think a lot of the media have played that or certainly a lot of policymakers who perhaps don't understand pedagogy very well have seen that as the answer um, but what teachers have done is they've been able to craft they've been able to make sure that students have actually done a lot more independent learning it doesn't have to be mm -hmm online. I've, I've, I've actually noticed as we talk about inclusion in, in this seminar is that teachers are, very, are able to give much more attention to those students that need it as well. And I think the control has been much better. Um, I wouldn't want to see it replace the physicality of school, but at the same time, it really has allowed good solutions to work. And again, we've got students scattered all over who can't get back to Moldova for this academic year right now. And teachers, I've got a teacher in South Africa teaching the most amazing science lessons online. And there are always ways to to, to find this. I, I think sort of, you know, almost Forrest Gump, boring is what boring does. And, it, it, you know, it's better. I've seen some teachers who in the classroom have, have sort of bombed on a, a sort of Tuesday afternoon because they've tried too much or they've... It really has just made us think about our teaching. And again, it's, it's preparation and it's making sure that um, you understand your classes. I think the only thing that's really... The one thing that perhaps unites most educators is that that idea that the parent is now in the classroom and that really it's not a bad thing personally i i think actually again when we talk about partnerships for, for young people school and parent partnerships when they're at their strongest can really really nurture and develop um young people but again those conversations can help you know my wife was helicopter parenting all my kids on the DLP here for three months until I <laughs> I had to tell her to kind of leave them to it in their bedrooms and just let them get on with it. You wouldn't do this in school. And and she did eventually. <laughs> uh, Thank you. I, uh, yeah. Uh, you know what it is? It's um, it's the, the, the concept of changing mindsets. 
because we have whether parents attending the class or whether the teacher teaching the traditional way, it's not going to happen. It's not going to, it's not, the, the learning is not going to take place. The student, uh, definitely, it's not going to take place. If it's just going to be lecturing and traditional teaching, the way we used to do it in, in, in school, which in any way in school was not working properly. So we really need to start having an open mindset concerning how I'm going to give my class uh, online, how to work, how can I make my students active? It's not about just, it's really, it is, it is very important for preparation. It is very important for the teacher to know that we have moved to Mars and we no longer are on earth and we have to recreate the way we teach and learn. Karen, I'm wondering if from the work you do, um, maybe what you're seeing is another a word that I keep um, hearing a lot in uh, COVID is acceleration. We've been thinking about how we change things, but this has accelerated what we do. And so I wonder if your work with teachers has maybe accelerated the, um, the, the actually doing of changing teaching methods or adopting things that people were talking about, but maybe didn't feel the, the timing was right. Yeah, I think it also accelerated us getting a puppy. So this is cool. Yes. <laughs> um, She's, she's, she will be a global puppy, but she just needed a cuddle. So we will, <laughs> I, I can answer, but this is Coco and I answering. Um, I, I think the, the acceleration is something that, that I've felt. And just before lockdown, I was doing a keynote in Ireland and then in Northern England. And I had seen what was coming. I was supposed to, I'm a visiting professor in, in Shanghai at Shanghai Normal. And then we had friends coming from Italy. So we were watching COVID roll and sort of seeing what was coming. And one of the things I said in both those keynotes that I think people thought I was crazy at the time was that you, I, I don't toss authenticity around lightly, but one of the things that I had said to all the leaders in the room was that this will force you to lead in a way that is different than you've led in the past. And even if you've led with your whole self, with your family, with your puppy, with your hobbies, with your sort of compassion and empathy, COVID and what I believe is about to happen will require you to ratchet that up to a degree that you didn't think was both possible or desirable. And what I've seen is that um, it's, it's really difficult. So Rob was saying that he's got sort of the confluence of countries and Rala has sort of come from two countries and I'm also from two countries. And I think that every country has their own uh, way of dealing with feelings and with empathy and compassion. In England, we're quite um, stiff upper lippy, I would refer to it at the moment. And I think that the acceleration of putting your feelings in the front has, has really started to happen. But how much you're able to do that is often constrained by the accountability infrastructure you're working in. So whereas I think if Ofsted here, which is our inspectorate, had just decided to, you know, go away, um, we would see a lot more feelings led teaching and a lot more open discussion about what people needed. We're limited because of what the inspection infrastructure is, is starting to do. So one of the things that I've started to do with all the groups of leaders and teachers that I've, I work with is that we start pretty much um, not with meditation. My son gave some advice to a, someone doing a keynote for heads in England and suggested that head teachers need to take care of themselves because they'll have their head in it all the time and maybe meditation or yoga would be good. Um, but what we do is I've developed um, a, what we're calling the pandemic privilege audit which walks people through in a step-by-step -step wise way, just thinking a little bit about what their experience during the pandemic has been and where they lived and what have they had access to and have, has their family lost income? Has it been unsafe? Um, and walks you through both from a, a personal an economic, a geographical, how far away from you from your family, but it's to try and set the, the standard that everyone has had a really difficult time and your difficult time may not look like my difficult time, but we have to move away from judgment and just meet people where they are. So I think there's an opportunity to accelerate how we're relating to people um, and, and holding that space not to judge, but it's, it's how do we let each other do that and how do we equip each other to understand that for so many of us who feel like we've done okay in the pandemic, there's a lot of guilt associated with that. So for so many of my friends, I'm heartbroken that I can't see my family on the other side of the ocean. I cried on Sunday night and it was it was not a pretty cry. Um, 
but I know that for some of my friends who can see their family, sometimes I just hate them. And, and finding that way for us to both love and, and hate and understand without mm -hmm. judgment is, is the space for accelerating our practice. And I think a lot of teachers that I've seen are actually are able to do that. They're putting things to the side. My son's class is sewing a lot and he keeps coming home saying like yesterday he, he sewed the Canadian flag and he does a wicked cross stitch. It's sick, yeah. And <laughs> I think that teachers are finding different ways to, to create that space. And I think hopefully we'll come out of it appreciating that you know your, your bad time is not my bad time, but I have to let you experience that and hold it if we're ever gonna be able to work together well again. Great. Karen, I'm gonna preempt what I'm sure might be happening on the, on the chat um, is people will wanna know about how to get this tool that you just described, yeah. so. Uh, um, I'll, I'll send it out. We actually, um, on, on some advice, we actually bought the URL and we're probably just gonna put it up for free. It's, it's pretty easy, it's a couple of slides, um, okay. but it, it seems to work really, it, it's really good at sort of just equalizing the tension. Right, good. Uh, so we have another question that I'd like to uh, pose to um, the, the group. Um, and this says, um, it's important support to support those children who are being bullied. But how do teachers, administrators, and community members deal with the bullies and their parents? <laughs> can, I, can I give a quick answer to this? <laughs> sure. if, if, if you were to ask my 10-year-old, he would say, my mom will just open a can of whoop ass. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we, we've had an incident with, a, with an unnamed child. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do as parents, and I, I wish I'm a governor at my son's school and I'm gonna recommend to them that one of the things that we've tried to do when there's bullying is to stop and ask the question, why might the bully be doing this, right? What's going on in their life at the moment, in their house, in the pandemic, that might make them feel that acting in this way is appropriate. Um, and that's given us a lot of space to have the conversation. And then I have helped my son reply to the bully. And when that hasn't been successful, I just text the mom with a screenshot and say, this is what's going on. I have no idea why. Is there anything you need? Can we be helpful? But this behavior isn't really helpful at the moment. But I wish our schools were giving sort of step-by-step -step guidance for parents about how do you do that in a way that won't break the community. So I don't know if Rala or, or Rob have solutions, but if anyone has them, I'd be happy to take them because opening a can of whoop ass is not always the best option. <laughs> uh, Rob, why don't we go to you and then we'll, we'll have let Rola um, be the last respondent since this is the topic that's been um, uh, present in her work. Sure. Um, I mean, there is no easy answer. Rolla will tell you this. There isn't a model, you know, that you could say every school followed this. And I mean, we, we, unfortunately, when we look at human nature, we see it in our, in our top leaders using these very tactics. And we saw that in a presidential debate the other week, uh, which was a great example to set to young people across the world on how we, you know, have dialogue and we treat each other. And I think that really is the sort of the the echo chamber we're in, isn't it? Especially the anger of some of our young people and some of our parents. I have to say here, um, as a school community, I've found that parental involvement seems to be, still have that strength that's needed to, to bring young people together if there are issues. And there are always going to be issues and, and there are always gonna be people that, um, you know, need, um, to be able to be spoken with and, and, and somehow, as, as Karen just said now, to try and get behind so much of those issues um, that, that affect young people. Nine times out of 10, you know, we, we know they're solvable. It's, it, 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 they're, they're small things that have been allowed to manifest or, but I have to say that we've got a very good psychologist here. And I have, uh, again, when you look at the sort of the schools that have invested in those kind of services for young people and they haven't just pulled their money into sort of you know, big academic sort of salaries. They've actually invested in support services within the schools, like a school counselor, school psychologist. Um, and here we've got a very good system of being able to kind of, you know, show that the behavior isn't acceptable in the community, but also not just leave it at that, but able to kind of, you know, bring parents in, bring friendship groups in. And one of the issues that we have in COVID, of course, is if you're, you're operating in isolation bubbles, it's often hard for kids to get away from sometimes some of the very people that are driving them crazy and winding them up and and I think we've got to be more mindful of that now as well that our children are having very limited experiences with who they come to, into contact with within inside the school itself um, 
So, I mean, unfortunately, there is, there, there's, there's no easy answer. Um, my own daughter, who's just started secondary school, had some boy. My daughter's a strong character, and uh, some boy decided that he wanted to, they'd have to have a fight. And she said, well, why do you want to fight me? Uh, took it to the teacher. The teacher spoke to his parents, moved the child. The problem's gone away. I wish it was all as simple as that. I really mm -hmm. wish it. My daughter has the strength of character to go and speak to a teacher. But again, not every child does. And I think it goes back to the idea, as Rod has said, and I'm sure Rod will say, that children have to feel there's somebody within the adult environment of a school and to be able to go and speak to and know there's going to be a consequence that, that actually somebody is going to, there's no false equivalence. They're going to at least be able to have, you know, this this victimization, this, this, this nasty stuff, to be able to stop and to be able to move on. And I think, um, again, the only thing I think is different in this school than I've experienced in other schools as a school leader is all the parents are, are very, very good at this. And, and actually all the parents, the children seem to still be a bit frightened of their parents getting involved. And it's one of the few cards I've got left to play <laughs> in a school. So it is like, I will phone your dad or, you know, um, is your mother in the country right now? So what would your dad say? Um, but there we go. Um, um, I, 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 I'll, I'll do what we need to do. Um, Great, Rola. Okay, um, there's a couple of things that caught my attention. First of all, uh, what Karen said, did we ask the bully why he's doing that? And sometimes if we really look into it, we can see that he's just another victim. It's just he's expressing uh, he's expressing himself or herself in aggression or uh, aggression towards others. So this is one thing that we really need to take into consideration. And what I liked about Karen's way, the way she dealt with the parents of the bully is that her positive, she didn't attack. And usually when you discuss, talk to parents without having that negative attitude or attacking your child is this, your child is that, and, and have them come in on board with you, is, is it's, it's a very tricky, thin line that's sometimes very difficult to come across and it's not always gonna work and it's not always gonna happen, but we do need to think that we are leaders in this situation. So we have to be leading without the bias, our own bias towards that child that he did something wrong or that the parents are gonna come in and be negative and do not accept what we're saying. If I communicate, which means I listen to them, they listen to me, and we talk together without being, uh, uh, without pointing the finger, if you want, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very gentle way. And like I said, again, like Karen did, is, is sometimes, most of the time actually does miracles. And if I can have the child, uh, uh, believe or understand or, or be able to analyze what's happening around him with the support of someone will definitely will make a difference with the way they're going to to act and this is not a one it's not a one um, it's not like a fixed criteria that we apply and everyone uh, everything works out everyone has their own way to talk to and, and it's, it's here where we're talking about special needs because I truly believe that the bully is one of the most people who has special needs in our school. Thank you. So I'm, I'm gonna pose what I think might be our, uh, our last question or we'll possibly turn the, turn the discussion a bit. Um, so do you think that the experiences of school closure and the wider pandemic will have an impact on the importance of SEL and inclusive approaches in the future. And this could be in the classroom and teacher preparation and how we work with parents. I mean, you all touch on this in so many different ways. Karen, you're, you're ready to go. <laughs> and the puppy, the puppy is down. <laughs> well, the puppy's down. Um, I, think, I think it has to. So my biggest worry at the moment is we're in, with head teacher friends and, and senior leader friends and teacher friends of mine in England. So many of them are saying things that I haven't heard them say as loudly before, which is, you know, I am at the end of my rope. I, I don't have anything left. 
And in situations where a, a, a friend of mine is the, the first woman head of English at a very, very prestigious private school in the UK. And I saw her yesterday and she didn't look great. Um, and I said, are you okay? And she said, four of my teachers are out with COVID. Oh. And, and she said, I don't know what to do. And I don't know how to deliver the education that we're supposed to be delivering. And I think what I sort of yelled to her as we were passing was at some point you have to say, I can't. And I think where the social and emotional side of things is, is that we need to start equipping each other with the language to be able to say, I, I can't give anymore, or I don't know how to have this conversation, but I am exhausted. Or, you know, I know that I know myself well enough to know that I am about to burn out. And I think we have a moment where, you know, and, and not to add too much pressure to it, we're going to have a lot of these moments. I don't think it's, it's going away in the near future. However, if unless we make sort of that discussion about how we're doing and equip people with the skills to have those conversations in a safe way in their school buildings, my focus is on the adults in the building. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm worried. So I think schools where the teachers have another, we talk about the kids having an adult in the building that they can talk to. We spend a lot of time saying, you know, do you know what your well-being tells are? Do you know when you are heading towards burnout? Because all of us know what they are. And then the question that we ask is, is there an adult in your building that has permission to not only know what they are, but to call you out on them when they see them? And I think those, we focus a lot on sort of protocols and language to help people get to the place where they can be fully sort of socially and emotionally engaged and, and just in their behavior. And I think that now, now is the time that we have to accelerate that or we're gonna lose a lot of teachers and leaders because at the moment they are working in a role in England at least where there's no PPE. The government has still said they don't want teachers um, and staff wearing masks in schools in primary schools at least. Um, so it's dangerous, it's not safe, it's exhausting, and everyone is sort of walking on that edge. So I think now is the time. Um, and I think as long as we feel safe enough and well enough to be able to act on that, there's a moment to, to take care of each other in a way that we haven't. Great. Uh, Rob? I, I agree totally with Karen right now. Um, the sort of strain that's placing on people who work in schools and, and I, every key worker, I, I accept when we're talking about education, we're talking about the people who are making sure our children are in schools and are actually kind of gets <laughs> skills and knowledge and nurturing to go forward. Um, they are exhausted and this is exhausting and there's no end in sight to it. I mean, this is the problem. It's, uh, you know, it, the war isn't over by Christmas. We are having to really prepare ourselves for the long haul. And it feels in schools right now as it would in May. People are that exhausted. So all their energy is spent. They are, it's as if we're about to face the summer holidays, not just the first break in October. And I think the well-being of our of our professionals and, and also the support staff behind them too, trying to keep our schools mm -hmm. functioning is, is really critical. And there is there's no answer because so much is expected from them all the time. And I think unnecessarily and carrying up absolutely right at some point, something will give. In, in, in this system um, and that's going to be the real danger because what we need right now in this crisis is, is uh, for children to feel safe and to feel they've got routines and to feel they've got a semblance of normality and every conversation and every experience isn't about COVID and that's where the schools are absolutely crucial in sort of the, the mental well-being of our entire society going forward. Um, in terms of um, the impact on SEL for the future um, I think it has actually changed the way, I mean, to, to, to cancel examinations in the summer, I mean, I really feel for the generation of 2020, my own niece is 18 and is now stuck in the halls of residence, having had her A-levels cancelled and then her grades, you know, messed around with, and now she's paying money to sit in the halls of residence, um, receiving online lessons up until Christmas. I mean, it is just, it, 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 it's just bonkers, that the approach that's been taken um, by, by governments. Um, but in terms of where we are uh, in, of, of SEL, you know, we saw in September the absolute joy of physically being back together. Um, no matter how short-lived that was, because, you know, we've got cases here. Um, we've, I never thought I would sort of know how to live with it, but, but, but we did. We found a way of adapting. In fact, I've got two teachers have just come back, um, tested negative. They've had their time. Um, and everyone's just saying, well, maybe we'll all catch it and maybe we'll have to just 
you know, um, show how we, we deal with it. But I, I think um, it's it's really you took that mindset shift, Roller, and I think for the first time we've questioned in education, you know, in some of the systems where it is very, you know, teach the test and exam focused, we really have had that drawn sharply into our sort of, you know, our main view of whether that really is the purpose of schools and whether that should be the focus right now. And that's been an interesting moment to see people change on this and, you know, to go back to the idea of, of, of sort of schools being way more um, than being exams factory. And maybe that's a good moment for the future. Um, and also different ways people are developing and different ways people are learning. Um, and maybe that's where, you know, we'll find some, I'm, I'm not sure it's a golden ticket as Hattie described. I, I think a lot of people felt not slightly glib, but, um, and, and I can see, you know, why John Hattie would say that, but right now it's a kind of survival and to get us through. And I think that's how most school leaders and school communities are, are, are viewing this. Now they've, they've got to somehow get us through this. We know that it won't be forever and we've got to mitigate the very worst against this. But I, I you know, we are all working together. I, I think that's the only strength I will say. The way that my parents have been here in the school community here, I mean, I'm really fortunate. The head of WHO countries, the kids come here and so is the head of the UN. They've been invaluable in the way that they've given their support and their help. And I think we've all found in our communities the really good stuff. I mean, you know, that 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 shows us the human spirit at its best and not at its worst. And I think, you know, we've got to go out there always, game faces on. That's 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 the the job lot of an educator and give them hope no matter what's going on in you know our backgrounds, our lives. And that's that's tough. But you know what? We know that when we close the door and we're talking about some wonderful book or some period of history or there's a lovely debate going on or there's a science lesson going on and all the kids and the smells and the sights and the noises, we know that we can we can find the sort of the oasis of learning that will keep you know us focused and fixed even in the in the sort of the worst of days ahead. So well one of the worst job parts of being the moderator is having to bring a conversation to the end. Um, I've forgotten our time signal. So I want to thank our panelists today, Karen, Rob, Rolla. What a great session. Um, I am thrilled that you all were with me to have our first session. Is it what I said is the first virtual webinar for Education for Tomorrow's World. I also want to really give a shout out to the Salzburg Global team, to Claire, Dominic, and Astrid for making this morning possible. They have been amazing and always are. And I want to thank all of you for joining us this morning. We appreciate you choosing to spend time with us. And I want to quote Desmond Tutu, Tutu when I ask that you do your little part of good where you are, because it's those little bits of good together that overwhelm the world. So thank you. We're going to ask that you take a 15 minute break, maybe do stretch, do a yoga pose, get a cup of coffee, but rejoin with us at 830. So thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.